boom. Okay, time to begin a new module. Uh, so today we're starting module three. Um, this module is about optical properties. Today's class is going to be, uh, we're going to talk briefly about the optical constants, uh, about the atomistic theory. Um, within the atomistic theory, we have uh, three theories, the free electrons without damping, the free electrons with damping, and the bound electrons. And in between, we'll talk a bit about reflectivity as well. That's going to be today's class. And then we'll keep talking a bit more about uh, other theories in next class. Okay, hopefully next class we'll finish this module. Uh, it's not a, a very large module like uh, the previous one. Um, okay, so let's start talking about the optical constants. And the first constant we're going to talk about it's, uh, is the, the most used optical constant. Um, and this constant actually defines how good uh, or how refractive a material is. And that constant is usually, uh, let me use my pointer, OK? It's usually given by, uh, or usually represented as an N, and it's called the index of refraction. What is the index of refraction? Well, it's actually, or this constant is defined by Snell's law. What does Snell's law say? Okay, so if we think of a material, okay, and we think of a ray of light coming in through a material, okay, or just hitting a, an object, a material, that angle of refraction, okay, the angle that basically we have, or to which um, the the light is re is refracted, is smaller than this angle here that is called alpha, the angle of incidence. Okay, so if I basically set my object here on the x-axis. I have my incoming light. That light, that beam light will be refracted. Well, this, ref, this uh, light or this ray, sorry, refracted, the angle of, of that refraction is smaller than the angle of incidence, the angle that the ray of light is coming and hitting my object. So the proportion between the signs of these uh, two angles, the angle of refraction, sorry, the angle of refraction beta over the angle of, in, of, of incidence alpha, I define it as N or as the index of refraction. Okay. So this tells me basically the refractive the refractive power a material has the higher the end obviously the more refractive the material is going to be now uh, this can be compared usually also as the we'll say the ratio between the refraction of a vacuum medium and the the the, the refract the index of, of refraction in a dense medium. So basically, it's an equivalence: the angle of uh, incidence versus the angle of, of refraction is a ratio, or a comparison between the refraction that you have or that we can have in vacuum versus the refraction in a dense medium. So the ratio of that also gives me the uh, index of refraction of a material. Any questions so far?
Okay. Now, there is a key to the index of refraction, and it's not, uh, this index is not constant for all wavelengths. It's actually a magnitude or a value that depends on the wavelength of the incident light. So this light that is coming in here, this beam uh, of light that is coming here into my material, into my object and hitting it, it comes with a wavelength, right? It has that, that beam of light has a wavelength. Well, depending on that wavelength, actually, the magnitude of the index of refraction is going to change or is going to vary. That's what we call dispersion. You can see here a table um, that summarizes the, the index of refraction for different metals and well, different materials in general, but realize this is for a wavelength of 600 nanometers. As I said, these values are gonna change if I change the wavelength, okay? This is usually a standard wavelength of, of typical you know, incoming light. Now, there is also um, a very interesting constant that is called K. Well, K is also part of the index of refraction. It's actually known as the imaginary part of the index of refraction. Um, it's a bit of a complex concept, so I don't want to get the, uh, into the actual theory of what K means. But let's keep it. Or what I want you to remember is that we have two constants that are going to help us to define the different optical properties in materials. So a lot of the formulas that we'll look um, or that we'll study soon, they're all going to deal with these two values, n and k. The two constants, actually both of them make up the index of refraction. n is the usual traditional real part of the index of refraction, and k is the imaginary part of it. Um, but again, let's just call them optical constants, okay? N and K are the two well-known optical constants that we'll use to calculate the, the properties or the optical properties of materials. Okay. Now, you can see something interesting here. The index of refraction for ceramics for polymers and for semiconductors is larger than one. But if you look at metals, the index of refraction is not larger than one. It's actually less than one. What does that mean? Or what does, what, what can this mean? Well, as we know, in general, metals are usually not very refractive, right? We all know that. And well, that makes sense because N is a small value. Look at silver, for example. It's only 0 0.05, very small values, right? So now, what does that mean? If we go back to the formula, actually in metals, these angles here, the angle of a refraction and the angle of incidence, if I have n smaller than one, actually this means, right, that usually the angle of refraction is usually a bit larger or around uh, the value of, sorry, the angle of incidence, right? That's why we have a small n. Right, so basically this value will be larger, right? Sine beta. So that's why usually um, in metals we have a different behavior um, when when a light when a beam of light is coming into the material. Okay. So basically, what metals do is they damp the intensity of light in a relatively short distance, right? 
and that's why we see uh, a, a small value of n in these materials. Whereas in the other ones, ceramics, polymers, and semiconductors, the values of n are a lot bigger. Any questions so far? No, mister. Okay. Okay. Now, you in, in the table, you can see two other constants, right? You see a W and you see an R in percent. Well, W is what we call the characteristic penetration depth. What is it? Well, it's that distance at which the intensity of the light web, um, which, you know, it's traveling through the material, has decreased in a value of 30% of its original value. So the characteristic penetration depth, this, va this value of W, is the distance at which the intensity of the light wave that is coming through the material that basically hits the material has decreased 30% of its original value. So that basically means when the intensity, now it's 1 over E, right? And we can calculate that. This is the characteristic penetration depth. Um, to the uh, this will be equals to the wavelength, right? Over four pi times k. But now k, remember, k is no longer, is no longer dealing with up, with uh, electrical properties, right? So k now, remember, is part of the optical constant or is one of the optical constants. So that's how I can get the characteristic penetration depth. And the inverse of that is what we call absorbance. So the absorbance of the material is just the inverse of the characteristic penetration depth. Uh, sometimes it's usually called the attenuation that a material has as well. And as you may imagine, the units of absorbance will be reciprocal length. Right, so let's say nanometers uh, to the negative one or millimeters to the negative one, depending on what um, what unit you want to use, but it's going to be the inverse or, or sorry, the reciprocal of length, right? Because it's be basically the inverse of this characteristic penetration depth is given in length, right? Uh, so the inverse is going to be reciprocal length. So, these are the three optical constants uh, that we have here, A and K and W. And well, absorbance, again, is just the, uh, the inverse of W, right, of the characteristic penetration. Now, let's go to the last one. And actually, there is another one that doesn't appear here, that's the transmittance, but let's go to R. R is the reflectivity. Okay. Are characterized by a, by a very large reflectivity. Why? Because light in a metal only penetrates to a short distance because it's such a dense, nicely packed, arranged material. Remember, all metals, well, not all, but most metals, metals that we know, alloys that we work with, uh, mostly in engineering, they're usually nicely arranged, nice, nicely organized, um, very um, crystalline materials. So when light comes through, it will only penetrate a small or a short distance. That's why metals have a larger reflectivity. So, this energy that is coming in, this uh, beam of light that is penetrating the material, only a small part of it gets converted into heat, right? And that's why metals usually don't heat very easily, don't warm up very easily if you just put it to 
let's say, under the sun. Okay. If you convert, for example, um, let's say if you put a glass, you, know, you put a glass under, under the sun and put a piece of metal under the sun, obviously the, the glass is going to warm up a lot more than what the metal is going to do. And that is because in metals, most of that energy that is coming in, the, the energy of the beam of, of the light of the sun that is coming in, the majority of that energy in metals is going to be reflected. And only that small part that gets penetrated, well, that is converted into heat. Whereas in, in other materials, like glass, a lot of it will come into the material, will not be reflected, therefore a lot of it will be converted into heat, and only a small part will be reflected. Um, and actually, and you can see here, uh, the difference between, let's say, glass and metals is actually seven, order of, seven orders of magnitude. Um, so you, you can see it is a huge difference. And you can make this very little experiment when the, when the sun is shining, let's say at 12 p.m., go and put a piece of metal and a piece of glass um, under the sun and see after, let's say, 10, 20, or maybe 30 minutes, go and touch them and, and check what, uh, which of them is uh, hotter. So materials that usually, and, and now you can start seeing something, right? Materials that are usually poor conductors, electrical conductors, I mean, they are usually poor reflectors. Whereas materials that are very, or that have very good conductivity or good electrical conductivity, they are usually very good reflectors. So they usually have larger reflectivity. Any questions so far? The absorbance and transmittance, is the parameter used for for FTIR or, or not? Sorry, you said absorbance is a what? Absorbance and transmittance parameter that you just calculated. Um, is that parameter used for FTIR test? Yes, yes, FTIR. Um, makes use of, of, of absorbance or transmittance depending on and we're gonna see transmittance right now uh, but yeah there's usually a relationship between all these um all these constants and yes absorbance and transmitters are the the two main ones that, that uh, ftir uses uh yes obviously the formula in ftir is, is a bit different um, for FTIR, these values are calculated in, in a slightly different way, uh, but at the end, the concept is the same. It's, it, it is the same idea. It is basically, um, or it has to deal with uh, light coming in in different um, spectrum, right, of, of, of different wavelengths, and then, you know, giving the characteristic map for each material depending on the wavelength that you are, you know, it will reflect uh, <clears throat> and it will transmit certain, um, depending on, on the components you have, it will transmit uh, more or less uh, light at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is the same concept. And please, would you, would you repeat the last uh, sentence you said about good conductors and bad conductors and the reflectivity? Yeah, usually, um, this is not, again, this is not, let's say, a rule of thumb, right? But it usually happens that when a material is a good conductor, a, a good electrical conductor, I, I should make the difference because it's not the same being a good thermal conductor. A good electrical conductor, usually a material that is a good electrical conductor 
is a very good reflector. So that means it, it usually has a larger reflectivity. Whereas those materials that are usually poor electrical conductors usually have very low reflectivities. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. Cool. Okay, so now let's see what what's this what, what are the definitions right of reflectivity and transmittance because yeah, we, we're already saying okay so large uh, sorry light is reflected and blah, blah blah but how do we define reflectivity right we're gonna see that actually reflect the reflectivity concept gets a bit more complicated as we well, as we get into the atomistic theory but now this is just let's say big picture right where these formulas are still the, the big picture of, of materials we're gonna get into the the atomistic theories and then we'll see how how these formulas change and how sort of understanding the, the concept of, of of reflectivity transmittance and all the other optical constants gets a bit more complicated but for now reflectivity is just the ratio between the reflected intensity and the incoming intensity so as you can say or as you can imagine is just how much of that incoming intensity of light was reflected that's it so from that hundred percent of light that came into the material how much of that intensity got reflected that is reflectivity. That ratio between how much came in and how much got reflected. And so the concept of transmittance is basically the same, or it, it's basically similar to this. Transmittance is just the ratio between how much of all that intensity that came in was transmitted. So instead of being how much of it got reflected, you just say how much of it got transmitted. So as you can imagine, actually, IR plus IT, what is it going to be equal to, guys? If I were to add up IR, the reflected intensity, and IT, the transmitted intensity, what do you guys think is going to be equal to? To the incoming intensity. Yes, to the total incoming intensity, so I not, right? So there is a relationship, obviously, between reflect, or a, let's say a direct relationship between reflectivity and transmitters, right? If I got a higher reflectivity, I'll obviously get a lower transmittance and the opposite or vice versa is also true, right? A higher transmittance will be me a lower reflectivity, right? Because there is a relationship between IR and IT. So it's just the ratio of from the whole uh, impinging light, from the whole intensity of light that came in, how much of it got transmitted or how much of it got reflected, that is reflectivity and transmittance. OK, these are simple, very easy definitions, macro picture. Question so far, is everything clear? Yes, yes sir, everything clear. OK. Now. We're going to start, uh, I would say, digging into more, um, let's say, a smaller scale to the picture of, of, of a smaller scale. Um, and actually, for, let's say, with different theories that, and you know, it's, it's very, sort of complicated explanations and I, I don't want to get a lot into that but um, for insulators we can say that instead of measuring 
or instead of yeah instead of measuring the the, the, the intensity the, that was radiated that was reflected because that's usually a bit more complicated actually for insulators we can simplify this equation or I guess we can make uh, the calculation of reflectivity a lot easier uh, because for insulators, and this is again for insulators only, R, so the reflectivity depends only on the index of refraction, and it's given by this relationship. You can see the index of refraction minus one that square over the index of refraction plus one all that square. And that is, again, macro picture still of the reflectivity for uh, insulators. Now, there is another, let's say, more accurate relation. And this is especially for metals, but metals in the infrared region. What do I, what do I mean by the infrared region? So when the incoming light has a wavelength that is in the infrared region. Okay. So Hagen and Rubens derive a relationship right, to make the calculation easier because it's obviously complicated to calculate the intensity. So they, make, um, they made it easier. And so only for the infrared region, metals, um, as I said, they are usually good reflectors, right? Because they are usually good electrical conductors. Uh, and so I, or sorry, Hagen and Rubens derived this relationship. Now you, you may be wondering, what does this mean, right? And remember, this is only at frequencies below 10 to the 13 as inverse, inverse of seconds, right? So it's only at that frequency. That's why I'm saying uh, what I said. It's in, in the infrared region. Um, now you, you may be wondering, okay, what do this means? Well, epsilon naught. You guys all should remember from last um, last module is the dielectric or or the permittivity. Are also called the, the dielectric um, constant, remember, of, of air. So this hasn't changed. Okay. This B is usually, or it's usually, it is the frequency, okay, the frequency of, of, the, of light. And sigma naught is equal to sigma. So it's basically equal to the conduct, to the direct current conductivity so again to the conductivity so this is only valid for small frequencies that we can make this assumption right that sigma equals sigma naught and this sigma naught so it's basically the conductivity the direct current conductivity the conductivity that you can calculate for a material that we calculated for a material so you can use that but that this relationship is only true at small frequencies. Okay. So that's why this relationship is actually quite good for metals to calculate the reflectivity of metals. But again, it has to be for very low frequencies. Okay. They actually derive this relationship from empirical um, data, right? They just were making a lot of experiments for different metals and they and they came up with this relationship. Okay. Is it clear, guys? So we can see now, or, or we can see two equations for insulators and for metals, the reflectivity of insulators and metals, but um Keeping in mind that the for metals it only applies as long as I'm in the infrared region. So as long as I I have low or small frequencies. 
Okay, so these relationships that we, we've seen here, um, actually, let's say deal, deal with a macro picture of, of how materials behave, but they don't really um, take into consideration quantum mechanics, right? And they don't really consider what happens at the atomic level in material. For example, the Hagen Rubens rela relation that we just saw. Yes, it, it's it's an empirical equation you derive from, from experimental results of metals, but in the far infrared region, right? Yes, it, 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 it works quite well, but only in the far infrared region. If we go to higher frequencies, right, so near infrared region or the visible spectrum, well, the, you know, the spectrum that we as humans can see, if we use that relationship, the experimental observed reflectivity decreases a lot faster than one is that what that one that what it is predicted by the Rubens equation. So again, this equation works quite well, but only for small frequencies. If I want to go to higher frequencies, and higher frequencies mean the visible spectrum, for example, the reflectivity in metals will decrease a lot faster than decreases if we were to um, use the hagen rubens equation. And so, People started saying or trying to, based on this equation, they started to, to study and, and research and analyze, okay, what can we do? How can we make these equations a lot more accurate, especially for high frequencies, right? Because uh, it's also very useful to have uh, equations that are accurate at high frequencies. For example, at the visible spectrum, that is something that we're very interested in, right, as engineers. So, Drude came up with, with an atomistic model, um, just correcting this Hagen Rubens relationship. And he said that we can consider some electrons in a metal to be free, which is not a bad assumption, right? So, he considered some electrons in a metal to be free. What does that mean? If they are free, okay, we can separate it, separate them from their nuclei. Right? So that was the first assumption he made, and it is a very valid assumption, as you can as you can see. Well, he also said, what happens, or let's assume that these free electrons can be accelerated by an external electric field which is also a very valid assumption, right? If I put an electric field, same as what happened in, in electrical conduction, right? Remember, if I have an external electric field, free electrons get accelerated. They start moving with this external electric field, so it's a very valid assumption. And he also said, okay, so now as these free electrons are accelerated, so I start moving with this, um, electric field, well, they also will start colliding with another, with other metal atoms in, in the lattice, right? And if it's non-ideal, obviously they will start colliding. Non-ideal means, you know, real materials. So in, uh, that impurities exist, that, you know, grain boundaries exist, that uh, defects exist, you know, so. So these assumptions, are, these assumptions are actually quite accurate, right? Free electrons in a metal, they can be accelerated in an electric field, and they start colliding with other atoms. So very good assumption. So these free electrons, because of you know, these, these three assumptions, so he said, okay, so the electrons must perform periodic motions 
in the alternating electric field of the light. So basically, they will start moving, let's say, okay, they go up and down, up and down, up and down. So the motion of those electrons are periodic, so they are not moving randomly. They are actually moving in a periodic way with this electric field. Obviously, these vibrations, this motion, this periodic motion is restricted because I have, you know, interactions of the electrons with other atoms and everything. So it's not that this periodicity of movement is just free. No, because it is restrained because of the collisions, right? But we have this periodic motion of electrons. So it makes sense. Well, now if you think of, you know, electrons moving in a periodic way, and collisions happening, right? Then between movement, you know, and, and collisions, then something is introduced, and that something is actually a friction force, right? That a force that basically um, represents right, that interaction that's happening between the moving electrons and the collisions that 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 happens between that, that movement of electrons that periodic oscillation of electrons and let's say other atoms in the same lattice so just making that consideration and then we'll see that uh, this is actually the free electron theory so it's going back to first module this um is basically is adapted to the free electron model as we saw and and with this you know these considerations and then the whole derivation of equations that we'll just see the final result later um it allowed this considerations of this assumption to Drew, it allowed them to correctly reproduce the spectral dependence of the reflectivity even in the visible spectrum. So that means it allowed him to adjust that H&R model and make it accurate even four frequencies at the visible spectrum. Now, going even further, so going higher than the visible spectrum, so going to higher frequencies, then another problem appears. because the experimental found reflectivity eventually rises and then decreases again. And then we will see the picture in, in the next slide. So bear with me. We'll, we'll see how, how this looks like you know, graphically and it will be probably more understandable. But so, you know, one, one will say, okay, we'll just keep decreasing, keep decreasing. And actually that's what um, the Drude equation predicts. But, you know, once we, if we go in and measure the, the reflectivity, one, one finds that, you know, at higher frequencies, higher frequencies than the visible spectrum, actually reflectivity increases or rises and then decreases again. So that absorption band that is called, because, you know, it, it goes, the reflectivity uh, goes back up again. So that, let's say, uh, deviation cannot be explained by true theory. But that can be explained by someone that said, OK, so Hagen and Rubens started with this model, this simple model that works at low frequencies, but not high frequencies. Then Drew adjusted the model, and now it works at high frequencies, but up to the visible spectrum. So Lawrence said, okay, I'm gonna modify a bit so I can adjust or in take into consideration now 
or my model now has to work to consider this absorption band that is created. Uh, once we, uh, you know, once we, someone measures reflectivity in a material. So Lorenz, he said that, sorry, electrons should be considered to be bound to the nuclei somehow. So he said, let's, let's not, we're not going to use the free electron model anymore. We're actually going to consider electrons bound to their nuclei. We said no free electrons anymore. Let's use the model of bound electrons. So electrons bound to their nuclei. And he said, OK, an external electric field is going to displace the positive charge of an atomic nucleus against the negative charge of its electron plane. And as you can see, a dipole will be created. So remember, we saw this theory also in, 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 in electrical properties, right? When we see this bound electron, actually, so now we're considering that cloud of electrons, we're considering bound to, their, bound to their nuclei. So now, if I apply an electric field, what's going to happen is there's going to be a polarization between the positive nucleus and the negative electron cloud. So a dipole will be created. Right? So he said, OK, forces are going to be created to sort of try to eliminate this, this, displacement, this displacement of charge, this dipole that has been generated. Lorenz also said that <clears throat> The centers of gravity of the electric charge are identical if no external forces are present. So if I don't put an electric field, the centers of gravity of the electric charge will be similar. Okay, so this is actually a good model, right? Um, he does consider it's actually a more complicated model. And again, there is a whole derivation that we'll, we'll probably see it in the tutorial, maybe. We'll just see the final result here. Um, but it, it is a good, um, but more obviously more complicated model. But now, because now you are considering probably a more real case scenario, right? That is, even though I, even though if I have three, uh, electrons in the outer shells, well, they're still bound, not as strongly bound, but they're still bound to their nuclei, right? So it's a more, let's say, a realistic assumption. And well, that actually allowed Lawrence to account for this absorption band that appears when, uh, when you know, the reflectivity is measured. Okay. So, and, and we'll see this, these theories uh, with, with the equations uh, a bit later, just bear with me. So now you can see this, and this is what I wanted to um, get to. This is, if the, the solid line that you see there, the solid black line is the measure reflectivity. So if you go experimentally and measure reflectivity, you'll get this, right? So you can see here, low frequencies, as I said, usually up to 10 to the 13 um, inverse seconds. The Hagen and Rubens relationship works well. You can see pretty well low frequencies. High frequencies, you know, we start getting into the visible spectrum, usually up to the red. You can see the Drude, uh, the Drude because you, you can see there, no, Hagen and Rubens totally start devi it starts deviating and then it just goes, uh, it, it's basically not, not accurate any longer. So I go to Drude theory. Now Drude works quite well, but up to here, you see, up to, 
usually the red visible spectrum. And then after that, you can see uh, the root theory predicts that the reflectivity will start or will continue decreasing. But you can see that the experimental results say, no, actually here, reflectivity comes back up and then it comes back down again, right? So Lorentz, you can see now Lorentz model, it actually accounts for that. So he, he accounts for this whole uh, decrease in reflectivity, high frequencies go to high free, uh, go to the absorption band, so even higher frequencies. And you can see that with Lorentz, there is this increase, right? Uh, in reflectivity, this increment in reflectivity, and then this de decrease again. Up to there, right? Going even to higher frequencies, then the Lorentz equation doesn't, or is no longer applicable, because then after this, it predicts that it just decreases forever. But you, why, why is the Lorentz one so important? Because usually for engineering purposes, we just need um, to measure reflectivity, or we just need reflectivity up to usually these frequencies, right? Usually up to the um, just a bit higher than the visible spectrum. Going after that, at least for engineering purposes, is not really useful. So, at least for engineering purposes, the Lorentz uh, equation in Lorentz theory, Lorentz theory works pretty well, and it. Uh, follows the experimental results obtained. Okay. And you can see here, uh, that's the experimental. You can see we're already in the UV, um, in the UV free, UV spectrum of frequencies, right? And the, still the Lorentz um, model works quite well uh, compared to the experimental one. You can see here how the Lorentz uh, model is very accurate, right? It's very similar to experimental values, right? Even in the UV frequency. Uh, David, I have a question. Yes. Um, the Lorentz um, theory applies only for the absorption band, or is it up to the absorption band? Up to the absorption band. So the Lorentz theory applies for everything applies for absolutely everything. Obviously, um, because it's a bit more complicated, uh, it depends on people, right? If you are dealing with, let's say, low frequencies, people just use the hang and rumens because it's a lot easier, you'll get the result, right? Uh, if you're working, let's say, up to the red visible spectrum, you can easily use the Drude equation that is not so complicated also, and you'll get a nice result. Uh, yes, you can use the Lorentz equation in these frequencies too, in this region, but it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit more complicated, the equation, I mean. Uh, so people usually just use the Drude equation up to here, and then after that, uh, if they're dealing with high frequencies like the variable visible spectrum or UV spectrum, then you use the Lorentz equation. Mm -hmm. So basically, these theories are actually the ones that um, make you know, a bit more complicated relationships uh, for the optical constants that we just saw. So we'll see now how how these theories relate to the optical constants. Any questions so far, guys? Is everything clear? Yeah, most of it. Okay. Um, okay, so Georgina, told me that because uh, of some problems, in, let's say health problems with, with her family, she won't be able to present the coffee break today. Uh, she'll do it on Wednesday. 
Uh, but, uh, oh, sorry, what am I doing? Anyways, let me, let me choose who's gonna be the person for next week. Okay, so let's see who's gonna be the person that will present next week. Oh, it seems to be Natalia. Okay, Natalia. Uh, oh, but I think Natalia, you presented already, right? No, no, no. no I haven't yet. No. Oh, okay. Okay. So you're um, you're next, Natalia. Please. Oh, so that will be next week. Okay. 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 Thanks. Uh, hmm, okay. Let's let's go back to class now. Okay. So now, you know, I, I gave them or, or, or these theories had had names, right? Um, these are uh, Drew and, and Lawrence. Well, they're actually relation uh, related, as I said, to theories that we already saw. So the Drew, Drew, sorry, consider actually the free electron theory. Right? It's basically the same. Or there is a, a very close relationship be between them. So um, let's go with, with that theory, okay? The free electrons without damping. So the completely free electrons, no restriction of anything, they're just moving freely, right? Like gas particles. So for that, we're gonna define something that is called the characteristic frequency or also usually called the plasma frequency well that value that's just another constant let's say that all it does is just separate the reflective region from the transparent region and it actually has the units of the square of a frequency so it's usually defined as frequency so it's actually let's say instead of actually being defined as a v1 it's usually defined as b1 square right? it's usually square of a frequency but it's still called the plasma frequency or the characteristic frequency right and as you can see it all it does is just says okay let's say you know up to this frequency up to v1 up to the plasma frequency my material is reflective and this is why you see this is a free, completely free electron theory without damping. So you can see a sharp change between reflective and trans between the reflective and the transparent region. Because obviously this this model is just so sharp. Yeah, the transition is quite sharp, right? The reflective region of the material until you get the, the until you get to the plasma frequency, once you get it then the material stops being reflective at that, at that uh, frequency and then it just becomes completely transparent, okay? You might be wondering, okay, what does this uh, equation, as I said, I'm not gonna at least not talk here about the derivation of these equations, probably we might do it in the tutorial. Uh, just to make sure everyone uh, is familiar with the terms here, E, as you know, is the electron, the, the electron charge. NF is the number of free electrons per cubic centimeter, such as, you know, we, we define it in electrical conduction, last, last module. Uh, for pi, you will know. E naught, you know, this is the, di F, sorry, epsilon naught, this is the dielectric constant, as you remember, and M is the mass of the electron. So nothing new, at least not really, uh, no new terms, right? So there, this relationship gives me the characteristic frequency, so that value at which the material stops being reflective and becomes completely transparent, okay? Now, what materials behave like this? You might you might be wondering. Okay, so this is such a sharp change. 
Well, this only applies for alkali metals. They are the only materials that can be represented by this model. The free electrons without damping can be represented by this equation that have this behavior, that they suddenly, from being 100% reflective, they get to the plasma frequency and they become completely transparent. And they are actually transparent in the near uh, ultraviolet region. Because remember, they are reflective up to the visible region. Then high frequencies is usually here around the UV region, the ultraviolet. So at that point, um, they are usually, or they become transparent. So now, what does this tell you about the alkali metals? Can anyone tell me the configuration of one of the alkali, the electronic configuration of one of the alkali metals? Or can, can someone look it up quick and tell me the electronic configuration of one of the alkali metals? Or if you remember on top of your head, one of those metals is lithium, and the electronic configuration will be 1s2, uh, 2s1. Two, two yeah, that is the, the, the important part. Thanks, Amari. So you said lithium, right? Lithium is 1s2, 2s1, right? And actually, if you look at the electronic configuration of all of these metals, it will always happen, you know, it might be two or three or four is, but it will be always one there. So this actually tells me that for alkali metals, that S electron, that electron that is in the outermost S level, can be considered to be free. And that's why the free electron model without damping works quite well to represent how reflectivity and trans and well reflectivity in general behaves in these metals. So alkali metals are 100% reflective up to the plasma frequency. After that, they become nearly 0% reflective. So they become completely transparent. They have a sudden change from reflectivity or from, from being reflected to transparent. And that is because of the electronic configuration. This one meta, this one electron that is in the outermost shell, that electron can be considered to be a free electron. Any questions, guys? Good morning, yes, sir. Yes, I have a question. Yes. What will be an application of this? What will be an application of this? What do you mean of, of the of the theory? Of the plus, yes, the free electrons without damping theory. Hmm. Well, I can't think of, of one application right now, but let's say it will be useful. If you want to know, uh, let's say if, if you're working or if you want to work with, um, with an alkali metal, uh, let's say with, um, yeah, let's say lithium or uh, what, what other of these lithium, sodium, uh, potassium is also a, a, a metal that you usually work in electrolytic cells, right? Um, that's usually also a metal, a, a very popular metal. Uh, that's this is the reason uh, why alkali metals are used in, I don't know which one. I don't know if it's same, uh, one of these uh, characterization te techniques, they are used as a transparent. Uh, yes, if it usually, I, I believe it's for, uh, for a material for the, for the sample. Yes, yes. 
Uh, and that's what I will, uh, an application, for example, I, I think electrolytic cells, uh, usually they, yeah, I, I, I don't remember, yeah, but when you're dealing with UV light, uh, sorry, in the UV frequency, so you, you in, I don't quite remember, but usually you have potassium there. Um, and you know, because you're at high frequency, that material is going to be transparent, so the UV light will just go through it. Um, because obviously, if you're reflecting, uh, the material, obviously, you know, some of that light will be reflected, not, uh, not the, the whole light will, will get into the, the, your material of interest. So that's why these alkali metals are used, as, as you said, um, as, as a layer of transparency uh, that, you know, allows light going through the, or reaching the material of interest. Um, yeah, so that would be, there are a couple of applications, but um, like, let's say any application, if you want to work with, or you need a material that needs, that you need to be transparent, and you are dealing with high frequencies, then you know you can use, uh, uh, or you should actually use um, an alkali metal because they are the only ones that can be, that can reach near 0% transparency. Or unless you want to use, you know, a, a completely, um, let's say, dielectric, that, that also works. But if you want to use a metal, right, if for some reason you have to use a metal, and you, you need that metal to be transparent, you, you know that you must use alkali metals because they are the only ones that at high frequencies, you know, after the plasma frequency, they are near 0% reflective. So they are basically 100% transparent. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Okay. We'll see applications in the last Mister. part. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this equation uh, only applies to alkaline, uh, alkaline metals or, or? Yeah, oh, well, I mean, you can, you can use it for any metal. Oh, okay. The problem, no, no, no. The problem is that it's not going to be accurate. It, it's only accurate, and that's why I'm saying it, right? That's why, basically, I, I, I was describing these models, right? Because they apply only for certain materials, right? So, yes, we, we can, I mean, you can use it to calculate any, let's say, in any material, but it's not going to be accurate, it's not going to be precise. So, this only applies, if you want to be accurate, this will only apply for alkaline metals, because in, in alkaline metals are the only ones that you see this behavior. In other metals, you don't see this sharp change from 100% reflectivity to 0% reflectivity. You don't see that sharp change in other metals, only in alkali metals. And again, that happens because you are consider, you are using, or you're con you can consider this one electron in the outermost shell as a free electron. And that's why this model works for alkali metals. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, thanks, I got it, I got it. Nice, no problem. Okay. Now, so now you, you may you may be wondering, right? Like, okay, now how do you calculate the values, right? Because um, usually, uh, at least NF, NF is, is a difficult value to, to get, right? Because how do you know the number of free electrons per, per cubic centimeter, right? Well, for that, you always assume, right, that there is only one free electron per atom, right? And usually, yeah, I mean, one, one will say, yeah, but that, that should be true, right? Yeah, I mean, that should be true, but that's not really true. Yes, I mean, this one electron that you, you see there, um, it is a valid assumption for certain materials, but it, it doesn't always work, right? Uh, but yeah, at least in this case, yes, you assume one free electron per atom. It works quite well. Uh, so that means that basically the number of free electrons will be equal to what? This number of atoms per volume, right? It's just basically the number of atoms, because if you have one free electron per atom, then that means you have, or uh, your value of free electrons per cubic volume will be the same as your number of atoms per volume, right? Um, 
And so that basically, how do you calculate the number of atoms? Does anyone remember the number of atoms? How do you calculate it? Well, Avogadro's number. So in A is not Avogadro's number, right? In this case, N naught is Avogadro's number. Density and mass, atomic mass, right? Uh, you, you might remember that from chemistry, I believe. That's how you calculate the number of atoms per volume, okay? So basically, Na is equal to Nf, right, for this assumption. So if you were to calculate Nf and you were to find the, the plasma frequency, well, you need, uh, <clears throat> sorry, you need to just find the number of atoms per volume and, and you can use that value, okay? So you can see here the plasma frequencies, you can see here, for lithium, for sodium, for potassium, for rubidium, and for cesium, again, only alkali metals, you can see here. And you can actually see the, 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 the comparison between observed and calculated values, right? And you can see it actually, and, and here is the important part, right? Only for sodium, look at sodium, it's the same value, 14.3 times 10 to the 14, right? Only for sodium. You can see for potassium, for rubidium, for lithium, there are similar values. Let's say 14.6 to 19.4, 9.52 to 10.34. They're quite similar, but they're not the same. So that, that's why I said, actually, this, which, you know, one will think, man, this must be valid, like the, the best assumption you can make. But this is actually not completely true, even though you have. S1 in the electronic configuration, that's actually not a complete only one. Usually you have one point ish, but you know, that's that's dealing with a lot of um, quantum mechanics. Uh, but you can see, so this assumption of one free electron per atom works quite well, but you can see it doesn't give you the exact value because again, you don't, you don't have only one free electron per atom. You usually have one point something, right? Um, so that's why you only get for sodium the exact value. You can see that for the other ones, you get a similar value, a close value. That is good enough to, to say, okay, I calculated this plasma frequency. Okay, and you can see the, the wavelength there as well. You can see at which wavelength, right? Um, okay. And actually, you can see there the, the, the NF, the actually, and, and we're going to see what NF means. But NF is just actually the efficient or the actual number of free electrons per atom. And you can see it's not actually one. For example, for lithium, it turns out to be, you just calculate from here, right? It turns out to be 0.57 for potassium 0.8, for rubidium 0.79. So you can see it's not actually one, right? It's even a bit it's less than one or probably just a bit over one. Okay. Uh, so this is basically the explanation here, right? It's not only one or exactly one free electron per atom. Um, it actually happens that you have an effective number of electrons, right? So the effective number of electrons is just the ratio between the observed value and the calculated value. Right, just the ratio between the observed and the calculated one, and you get that efficient or that effective number of free electrons per atom. Right, um, and this is actually quite important if you remember this NF. Do you remember, guys? We, we were looking at or we use this value NF. In equations like the whole constant, um, superconductivity, sub semiconductors, remember we were using NF. Well, it's the same. It's the same term. So actually, a good and accurate accurate way to calculate NF um, is just calculating um, calculating it from the observed and the calculated um, plasma frequency values. And you can get an F and then use this, you know, for, for let's say the superconductivity equation. And then you will get a much 
more realistic value. Okay. Mister, go ahead. This concept about effective numbers of free electrons, it really is related to, um, for example, or the, uh, the electrons which are useful to the conduction in in metals is related because not not all electrons are are useful because the the concept of uh, Fermi energy and, and this. Yeah, but um, no, I, I wouldn't say they they are related um, because here we're actually talking about actual number of electrons per atom. Um, so we're actually talking about actually how many electrons are there available. Um, and then, you know, you, you can have more or less electrons, but then, you know, okay, from this, okay, these ones have the Fermi energy, and so these ones will be, um, or these ones are easy, or, or can jump into the, the conduction band, let's say. Um, but yeah, the, there's not really a, a relationship. It actually, this actually has to be with the actual number of electrons that you have uh, per atom. This is not really uh, how many electrons are contributing to electrical conduction. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So, okay, for alkali metals, it's quite easy to calculate an F, right? The number of, the effective number of free electrons. But for most metals, it's more complicated, isn't it? It's not easy to, to, to measure them. So we have to find or determine another way to, to find this value. And I don't want to, again, get into the whole derivation of this equation because it, it's, it's complicated. But you can actually calculate the effective number just by measuring N and K. As long as you are either in the red or in the infrared aspect. That means in a frequency without absorption bands. So if you go back in this frequency up to here, up to here, up to where the Drude model works, up to there, I can easily, uh, if I measure N and K, so if I measure the, the constants, the two optical constants, I can calculate the effective number of free electrons per atom. So N and K, you know, optical constants, B is frequency, for by you know that, uh, dielectric constant, mass of the electron, charge of the electron. So nothing new. So this way you can calculate then the effective number of free electrons per atom for other metals. Okay, not only for alkali metals. For alkali metals, this works quite well. You just take the ratio of the observed plasma frequency uh, and the calculated plasma frequency. Okay, any questions? Okay. So, this is the model, um, let's say the, the simplest model, right? Free electrons without damping, so free electrons moving, without collisions, without any barriers, just moving free. Now let's consider the, the case for free electrons with damp. So that simple reflectivity spectrum, so this simple spectrum, this simple graph from 100% reflectivity to 0% reflectivity. As I said, this doesn't happen for other metals. It's, it's very weird to find that in other metals, other than the alkali metals. 
So we need to refine our model. We need to adapt that this model and say, okay, this has now let's make it valid for other methods. And now we're gonna use the Drew theory. Okay. Remember Drew theory? What it says is okay, I have free electrons, yes, but they do collide. It's not that they are just moving uh, easily, freely, with no collisions. Now, he said, OK, I actually have free electrons, but their velocity is reduced by collisions with atoms in a non-ideal life. And remember, you know, defects, just you have a lot of, in, might be institutional atoms, vacancies, impurities, dislocations, great boundaries whatever you you want all those will influence and will uh, cause collisions between um, or with the electrons the free electrons the electrons that are moving freely right well so now that means um that i need to add a damping term and remember as as, as we when we were deriving the free electron model, and remember we said, okay, the, with the potential barrier, remember we, we set boundary conditions for that, okay, so the same will happen here. Uh, I will have to add to my uh, re uh, reflectivity equation, in general, the motion of, of atoms equation, um, that as I said, we might do this in the tutorial, the derivation, um, I will need to add a damping term. So a term, a value that sort of considers and takes into account the fact that that, that now electrons are not moving completely free, but are um, colliding with defects in the lattice. Actually, this damping term is, oh, sorry, this damping term is, this shouldn't be here, is, inversely proportional to the conductivity. So that means it is proportional to the resistivity. So the higher the resistivity, and I mean here electrical resistivity, right, and, and electrical conductivity, the higher the resistivity of a material, the higher the damping term will be. So as you can imagine, materials that are poor conductors have a high damping term or a large value of the damping term. Now you might be wondering, okay, what is this um, damping term? Um, and I don't wanna, the damping term is, is just a constant, okay? Um, that again, we might use it in, in the derivation, but then, you get the final result. As I said, I want to focus on the final result, okay? And you get epsilon one and epsilon two. What are epsilon one and epsilon two? Well, they are just um, optical constants, okay? These are just optical constants that basically are made up of the combination of the two main optical constants that we know n and k. So n squared minus k squared, that gives me epsilon one. Again, that's just one optical constant, a new optical constant that comes or, or that results from subtracting the square of the well-known uh, optical constant n and the well-known optical constant k. And the product of them times 2 is equal to epsilon 2. So these are just, don't, don't get your, your head confused, these are just optical constants and we'll see, they, are, they will be very useful because now from now on, everything is going to be around epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 and they are related to n and k. Okay, so epsilon one and epsilon two are just constants. And you can see now that something appears, V1 and V2. What are these values? So first of all, V2 is the damping frequency. 
B2 is the damping frequency. B1 is the characteristic frequency, although usually both are called the characteristic frequencies. And then B is just, you know, the frequency that we're dealing at. So the frequency, let's say, if we're at 10 to the 15 inverse seconds, okay, that's the frequency. So the, the frequency that we're dealing at, B1 is the characteristic frequency of a material that's also a constant, okay? And B2 is um, the damping frequency that you know, is also a constant that comes from this damping term that we introduce to sort of um, restrict or, or, or account for this restriction of movement of electrons because of the collision, okay? And you can see the values of B1 and B2 here. They are not random values. You can see B1, again, just depends on the electric, the charge of the electron, the number of free electrons per atom, the dielectric constant and the mass. So B2, is, this is just to simplify the equations, right? Because look at this, this in the equation will be so long and complicated. And then B2 just depends on the dielectric constant on the characteristic frequency on B1 and sigma naught. Remember, sigma naught is just the conductivity that we know that we calculated for um, the material, the electrical conductivity for the material, okay? So that's equal to just sigma. The sigma we all we all know. Uh, let me use. So this sigma naught is equal to sigma. Okay, the sigma we know. So epsilon one is just this, and epsilon two is this. And these are very important relations. Trust me, this will be very useful. Uh, epsilon one and epsilon two from now on will allow us to define the optical constants, right? And again, this is actually for other metals, not for alkali metals, but for most metals, okay? Um, and you can see here the values of the resistivity and of the damping frequency, right? Uh, and you can see there, uh, for not only for um, you can see here for for alkali metals but also for non-alkali metals so you can use this equation for both but usually you know people use it especially for non-alkali metals and you can see the relation there the higher the resistivity, let's, let's just look at this train so it, it's easier to compare. You can see a high resistivity, right? So let's say from 159 to 167, and then from 167 to 235, right? What happens with the damping frequency? It also increases, right? And that's what I said. The damping term is proportional to the resistivity. So the higher the resistivity, the higher the damping term. And remember that B2 is the damping frequency. So it basically depends on the damping term. So the higher the resistivity, the higher the B2. And you can see 1.59, okay, you have 4.35. You jump to 1.67, now you have 4.7. You jump to 2.35, now you have 5.9. So you can see easily the relationship between resistivity and the damping term or the damping frequency. Okay, any questions so far, guys? Okay. You can see the graphs there for epsilon two and epsilon one versus frequency, right? And you can see it makes sense. Uh, if you see epsilon one, well, let me erase all this. Epsilon one should look as a hyperbola going up, right? Whereas epsilon two should look as a hyperbola going down, 
right? So this makes sense. The results, the, the graphs make sense. And you can see that eventually, you know, epsilon two will uh, approach zero at very high frequencies and epsilon one will approach one at the very high frequencies, right? You can see that from the equations that makes sense because this term eventually, if I am at a very high frequency, this term becomes so large, what's gonna happen? This term will go to zero and that's why epsilon one approaches one. So that's what you see, you're looking at here, right? David, um, I have a question. Yep. Sorry yep. to interrupt. That's fine. Um, once I reach the damping um, frequency, what happens? The material becomes transparent or what, what happens once I reach it? Um, nothing happens once you reach it. Uh, this is just a value um, that basically allows you to account or, or quantify uh, this restriction that you have uh, for electrons moving in, in the material. But it's not really that, you know, happens something like, let's say, in the characteristic frequency when you had big one, um, that the material becomes transparent. Um, no, this is just a value that allows you to quantify um, or, yeah, that allows you to quantify the, how many collisions will exist and obviously uh, that uh, gets affected or that affects the movement of, of electrons in the lattice. So it helps me to know what are the restrictions of the electronic movement at that frequency. Yeah. yeah, so let's say if you have a metal uh, that is not a very good conductor, then you know that B2 will be will be higher. Um, or if you have, let's say, a material that, you know, on the other hand, is actually um, a very good conductor, like, let's say, actually here, um, gold, there is usually a good conductor of, of electricity, right? Um, you know, well, you won't have a very huge value, right? So it really depends on, it, it, yeah, it, it's just a value that allows you to quantify whether your material will, or whether the electrons in your material are actually moving freely without a lot of restrictions or without a lot of collisions, versus another material that will have a lot more collisions and a lot more restrictions for electron movement. And that's it. Okay, thank you. No problem. So, okay. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, so where is here, right? If you have for epsilon two, right? If you have, uh, or if you have a, a, a high, the higher the frequency, right? Let's say this term, and this term goes up, go up. What was gonna happen is this whole term is gonna go down, right? The whole term is gonna go down and it will approach zero and that's what we see here, right? It eventually starts decreasing until zero, right? And that is a very high frequency. So, you can see these uh, these results actually make sense. Now let's gonna give them names. I said these are electrical constants that you know depend on n and k. Actually, let's now give them names. Epsilon two is what we call in engineering absorption. Epsilon two is the absorption of the material. And epsilon one is the dielectric polarization of the material. Epsilon one is the dielectric polarization and epsilon two is the absorption 
of the material. And as you can imagine, the higher the frequency, the lower the absorption of the material. Which makes sense. Okay. Question so far, is it clear? Okay, now let's look at, at special cases uh, that happen. So if we are in the UV or in the visible or near the infrared region, we know that in that region, you can look at the spectrum, just go look up the spectrum of frequencies. The frequency in, in, that, in that region varies between 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 15 inverse seconds. And if you see, he, just, just let's take an average of this, of these values, take an average of all these values. You'll get an average of around 5 times 10 to the 12 inverse second. Right? That's the average damping frequency. So if you see, if we are at the in this region, either in the UV, the visible, the visible, and near the infrared region. Actually, the frequency is a lot higher than the damping frequency. Right? It's two or three orders of magnitude bigger, right? At least. So, the absorbance Right? The, sorry, the absorption is not absorbance, not the same, I'm sorry. The absorption this equation I can simplify it because I know that B squared plus B2, actually this term is a lot bigger, right? This term is a lot bigger than this one, so I can simplify and say, well, just use it or uh, approximate that B square oops, plus b2 square is approximately equal to b square, right? Because this one is a lot bigger than that. And therefore, my equation reduces to b2 over b times b1 square over b square, right? So you all agree with that, right? Because obviously, the, this value is two or three orders of magnitude bigger. Now, if we were actually to say, and this actually can be considered true, a dose in this region, B is approximately equal to B1. Usually, the characteristic frequency is approximately equal to the frequency itself. It, it, it's quite similar. And therefore, I can simplify that. And my absorption will just be equal to the ratio of the damping frequency divided by the frequency, right? Because you just replace this here, you know, and then B1 will just cancel out and you'll end up with B2 over B, right? This will just be simplified and then you, you end up with B2 over B. And this is again a valid assumption when you are in this region, in the UV visible and near infrared region. So the absorption just gets reduced to the ratio between the damping frequency and the frequency you're at. Okay? So that is for that for that for those regions. Now, what happens if you are at very small frequency? Very, very small, then what will happen then is that this frequency obviously it's gonna be a lot smaller than your damping frequency. Therefore, what can I do? 
let's actually look at this. So I can neg neglect in the denominator, right, B2. If I, if I look at this equation, right, and I know B is much smaller than uh, B2 square, sorry, B is much smaller than B2, right, I will actually, I can actually do, let me do this because otherwise it will be, you might get confused, it will be 2, sorry, n k times b, right? And then, you know, well, I, I can use also the equation for b2, I, we can combine these equations and you'll get this, okay? Uh, you might get lost in this part, but all we did is just multiply n games and this b. Okay, let me delete all this so I can explain this better. B, this b comes here, right? And because b square or the frequency is a lot smaller than the damping frequency, in, uh, you can assume right here in the denominator. Um, that this value is just goes to zero. This value goes to zero, right? Or that value doesn't basically add up more, or doesn't add up much to the to the fine to the denominator. So you basically end up with what b two times b one square over b two square, right? So you simplify B2, uh, B2 with that, and you just end up with B1 squared over B2, right? And that's what you get here. B1 squared over B2. So that's what you see here. B1 squared over B2. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and obviously, where does the half come from? Comes from from here because it's two and k, right? So the two just comes down here, goes to divide. Okay, it's multiply into n k because I'm using n k b. So the b came here to multiply, so the two comes here to divide. Okay, so that's just it. And then. Um, so you can multiply this and use this equation or this value for B2, right? If you just use the value of B2, so you replace here B2, uh, and you get, you'll end up with this equation because you remember the big ones will cancel out and then you can just do the math, okay? And you'll get this equation. <clears throat> so, here comes the interesting, the interesting part. In the far IR region, so in the far infrared regions, the alternating current conductivity and the direct current conductivity may be considered to be identical. So in the far infrared region, so that is for very, very small frequencies, right? In far infrared region means very small frequencies. You can see sigma and sigma node are the same because look at the denominators, they are the same, right? So sigma and sigma naught can be considered to be equal. And that's something we, we already assumed, right, before, remember. So these are the two special cases. If I'm in the UV, visible and near infrared regions, if I go to very small frequencies or far infrared regions, I have these cases, right? In far infrared regions, conductivity is equal, well, direct current conductivity 
is equal, this is direct current conductivity is equal to the alternating current conductivity, so sigma equals sigma naught. And remember, we already used that equations, those equations already somewhere here, remember, right? Here. Uh, and I remember there was another one. I sh should be somewhere there, okay? And we also um, made use of that equation, I think, in, in the last module. So this is very important, right? Um, okay, questions? Okay, so now let's let's go and find reflectivity. Okay, because I was basically using it to calculate the absorbance and uh, the dielectric polarization, right? Now let's go and calculate reflectivity. Um, you just use, well, you can calculate it, reflectivity using E1, Epsilon1 and Epsilon2, uh, or at the end you just calculate it using NK, okay, so reflectivity is this, guys, it's, well, there's an imaginary part, a whole derivation that I don't want to get into, but this is the final equation for reflectivity of metals. And to calculate that, obviously, you need B1 and B2. That's where the values of A and K are going to come from. And that's what you can see here in the, in, the, in the graph. You can easily see mark B1 and B2, right? The characteristic frequency. So now you can see, look at this, guys. This is for real metals, right? Look at the solid black line the transition from 100% reflectivity to 0% reflectivity is not sharp. It still happens at B1. It still happens at the characteristic frequency. So, and this is something you were asking, um, Natalia, what happens at B2? Nothing happens at B2, you see there. Nothing really happens at B2 with the reflectivity. Um, so at B1, yes, the material starts becoming transparent, but you can see now it's not a sharp transition as in other metals. This is actually a smooth transition. Okay. And so this is the equation for reflectivity in most metals. Okay. And obviously you calculate these values from uh, the absorbance and the dielectric polarization. So from epsilon one and epsilon two, using B one and B two, you calculate N K, and then um, you use those values of N and K to calculate reflectivity, and then you can plot it and um, find reflectivity. Okay. So transparency happens when uh, when they reach the the peak or the dielectric polarization or when they when reach you, what you pre previously you said that uh in this case epsilon one is the dielectric polarization yes it is. and the p1 is the characteristic frequency so once they reach that frequency they become transparent yes it's the same concept um so in this case let's say for alkali metals when they reach the characteristic frequency, the material becomes completely transparent, right? Um, in, in other metals, when they reach the characteristic frequency, as you can see there, it's not a sharp transition, but, they, but yes, they start losing, I wouldn't say they become 100% transparent as in alkali metals, but yes, they lose reflectivity or they start losing once they reach the, the characteristic frequency. Usually they are halfway through. They are halfway through. So they, they're basically, they have 50% reflectivity. They're usually here. When they reach uh, the characteristic frequency, reflectivity is about 50%. Uh, so they, they lose 
already half of the reflectivity uh, and they become or they start becoming transparent. Does that uh, have something to do with the, the rupture of the dielectric? I remember from physics three, when you reach the dielectric uh, constant, that the conductor became an insulator, no, the insulator became a, a conductor. Does that have something to do with it? Yes, um, from here, look at E1. When you reach B1, Look at the epsilon one at the dielectric polarization. When you reach the characteristic frequency, the value is zero. The, when the dielectric polarization becomes zero, it 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 reaches basically you reach the characteristic frequency. So yes, you break um, the the dielectric effect, and then that's why it will from there it will just start approaching one. So yes, it obviously has to do with that. Thanks. Now it's clear. Okay, that will be it for today's class, guys. I'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, I'll see if we do a tutorial. I'll see if we might do the, the correction of the exam if I'm done marking. So I'll, I'll see what we'll do on Wednesday, okay? But um, I'll see you on Wednesday, guys. Okay, thanks. Take care. Thank you. Any questions, you know, you can just drop me a message. Thank you, mister. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.